Hoy vamos a hablar con James Introcaso, uno de los diseñadores del MCDM RPG, el juego de rol de MCDM, la compañía de Matt Colville. Es un juego que es cinemático, es táctico, es heroico y es de fantasía, con mucho énfasis en los escenarios de combate. Le vamos a preguntar cómo surgió esta idea, cómo los afectó el escándalo de la Open Gaming License, la OGL, no sé si recuerdan allá por comienzos de 2023, lo que se mandó Wizards of the Coast, que nos enojó a todos. Le vamos a preguntar cómo llegaron a la idea de este juego, cómo es, qué desafíos tienen y hacia dónde va la compañía MCDM en el futuro. Todo eso y algunos consejos para jóvenes diseñadores nos va a decir James ya mismo. So, well, first of all, first of all, James, thank you for being here. This is such a treat for us. The MCDM RPG has over 30,000 backers. It has raised over 4.6 million dollars on backer kit. It is one of the biggest Uh, crowdfunded TTRPGs in history. So before we start, because this is something we will talk a, a lot about in this interview, what is, in the words of James Introcaso, the MCDM RPG? Ah, thanks. That is a that is a great introduction, and I uh, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, in my words, the, the MCDM RPG, and that's not the final name, so everybody, we get a lot of questions like, is this the final name? <laughs> It's not. We, we, are, we have other names. The game itself will have a, a different name than that. Um, it won't be just a bunch of letters strung together. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but yeah, so it is a fantasy role-playing game that is tactical in its combats because it uses a grid for combat and positioning matters and there are different ways that you can uh, work together with your teammates or the director can control monsters who work together against the team, right? And it is also cinematic in that we want to help the players and the director create these very big moments in the story that you might see in cinema and that you're like, this is so cool, right? There's a lot of times where we'll be discussing rules or discussing new things we want to put into the game. And we always say, is this cool enough? Should we make this cooler? Should it be bigger? Should it be more impactful, right? So tactical, but also we want it to be exciting and cinematic for people. Amazing. So Before we dive into it, now, how how did you get involved involved in MCDM? <laughs> It's a really good question. Uh, so I, for a few years, was doing freelance uh, writing, right, uh, for role playing games, and I had worked on uh, several Dungeons and Dragons hardcover books, and I had stuff on the DMs Guild, um, and I worked on some other role playing games like uh, Zweihander and I had worked on uh, City of Mist, um, and I was looking for maybe something full-time, uh, and there were uh, MCDM was looking for writers, not full-time, for freelance writers, and they said, hey, apply uh, if you're interested in working with us, and they had the best writing rate I had ever seen. It was 25 cents a word, which is, I had only ever done 10 cents a word before that, right? Um, and so I thought, oh, I, I could, I should apply. And I did, and I managed to get the gig along with some other really great writers, and I started to work with them freelance. And then uh, they wanted to make a fifth edition magazine called Arcadia, um, and they hired me full time then to be the managing editor for that magazine. Uh, and I've worked with them ever since. And that was at the beginning of 2021. I started with them. Um, so yeah, I've been with them now for three years uh, th uh, this year. It'll be my, I'm going into my fourth year now working full time. And now I'm the lead game designer there. Uh, I work directly with Matt Colville and we work together and make stuff. And the, the RPG itself is something that when I was hired, he said, what do you want to do like in the future? And I said, I don't want to work on D&D &D forever. And he said, that's great. Neither do I. And so we've right. always wanted to make a role-playing game, and now we're getting a chance to do it. Amazing. Uh, one little thing. You said uh, 2021. Uh, was this uh, before the pandemic? Huh. The, the, so, the... Yeah, my first freelance job. So 2021 is when I worked full-time, right? They hired me full-time to work with them. But freelance, I started with them... <laughs> at the end of 2019 
And I actually flew out to the offices to work with them on something at the beginning of 2020. It was the last trip that I took before the pandemic. So during the pandemic, I was continuing to freelance with them and work with other people. I was working with, you know, uh, Cobalt Press and uh, a bunch of other publishers, Andrews McMeal and, and things like that during that time. Uh, but then, yeah, 2021 is when I took the leap and I said, I want to work with you full time. And they wanted to work with me full time. So it worked out. So, so back to the, the MCDM RPG, you already mentioned some keywords that are really important. Um, tactical, heroic, cinematic, and fantasy. And you yes. also say cool. Uh, I, I will throw that in there. Why did you, did you choose this to be the defining elements of your RPG? It's a really good question. So we chose those because we wanted to create a flagship RPG. Matt, Matt and I have a lot of different game ideas we want to create, right? I would love to create a, uh, like a, a more gritty dungeon crawler uh, experience, right? With simpler rules. And uh, I'd love to do a superhero thing. There are board games we want to make, right? There are miniatures games that we have ideas for. There's video games, we, right? We have ideas for all of these things. Um, but we had to pick something to start. And we wanted to create something that we have a big 5e audience, right? That's what most of the people who are buying stuff from us is because that's what we made before. So we wanted to create a game that would appeal to that audience that we have who really likes us and we like them, frankly. Um, and we have often talked about our love. Matt and I both have a love for a lot of different tactical RPGs like 4th Edition D&D. I love 13th Age, um, which has a lot of 4th uh, Edition elements in it. Um, you know, I like to play uh, a, a lot of games on a grid, and so does Matt. And so we started to talk about that. And we, because we've done a lot of stuff with 5e, we've had a lot of conversations about, like, if we were going to do it ourselves, how would we change it? What would we do differently? And so it seemed like the natural choice for, like, okay, most of our audience... We know that they want a fantasy game. We know that they like heroic. We know that they like tactical because we've created products like Kingdoms and Warfare, right? Which is like a tactical war game. Flea Mortals was a book we put out this year, which was made monsters more tactical. So we know our audience likes that too. We know they like fantasy. And we know because they came to us from running the game, right? Which is Matt's video series where he gives a lot of advice to D, D dungeon masters about how to make their game more cinematic um and matt himself is a very big film buff right he loves to watch movies uh and he has a lot of good critiques and opinions and he's got a lot of education about movies um and so it seemed kind of natural that like we like this stuff and our audience likes this stuff let's start there instead of saying like let's go into a totally different genre and do something else which we love let's let's do what we know the people who are currently with us like, and then maybe we can branch out from there. There we go. So in a couple of interviews, you said, and it's, this is a spicy topic, that uh, the OGL scandal was the thing that lit the fuse of this rocket. Uh, this is the the yes. image you, you always use, right? This this rocket that was in your <laughs> uh, in your garden and you, and you decided to launch it after the OGL scandal. But you can of course tell us about this. But what I really want to know, because this is a, a look behind the scenes at, at MCDM, how how was that moment uh, where you decided to green light uh, this TTRPG? I mean. Uh, physically, if, if we had to, if, if you had to retell uh, the moment, when, where were you? Was it uh, in a video call? Was it in person? What was it like behind the scenes at MCDM? If, if we had to to tell people in the future for the history books how it happened? Yeah. So I mean, we were just as shocked as everybody else when we found out it was happening, and. Essentially, we, we called a meeting immediately as soon as we knew, right? And uh, and that meeting is in a video call because um, I'm in the east coast of the United States. I'm in New Jersey. Um, and most of my coworkers are on the west coast in California, right? Um, and so 
basically every meeting I have uh, is over video call. Um, and we knew Matt and I had been having a few meetings here and there in our free time about this game, right? We knew we wanted to create it beforehand. Um, and so we had like a long talk really a long series of meetings we first had a meeting that was just sort of like oh my god can you believe this is what's going to happen if this happens what will we do right and we talked about everything we talked about everything from you know hey it looks like it could be the reports are saying it could be like this um the reports are saying it could be you know this way or that way um and so we we sort of looked at it and we said no matter what happens we have realized that we are not in control of this game that we're creating stuff for, right? It's like you're creating DLC for a video game that you didn't make. <laughs> and and at any time, the person making that video game could say, nope, I, I'm taking it away. We're not selling it anymore. So your DLC is worthless, right? Um, and so I'm very glad that Wizards... You know that that it worked out as it did and wizards walked that back and and everything but it made us realize we need to be the masters of our own destiny and so for me it was scary at first but because we had already been working on this game it was kind of like a natural conclusion right every uh, there's like nine of us who work at mcdm and everybody in that first meeting was kind of like well i guess i guess we should do our own thing and we kind of have started already and and we want to do this. We talk about wanting to do this, but it's hard to break away from 5th edition. It's scary. That's where our audience is. That's the most popular role-playing game, right? What if we lose audience? But then it became like, it was like the push we needed, right? So going into the meeting, it was scary. I was nervous. Uh, I like had, uh, uh, you know, goosebumps from fear. And then by the end, I remember I came out of my office, the one that I'm in right now talking to you from, I came out of my office and I said to my wife, like, we're going to make the game, right? And she, because she knew I had been talking about, and it was so, it went from scary to exciting in one meeting. Um, and, and it was very much like by the end of that meeting, I was so happy that we were on board. Now I'm not happy. I was I was also nervous and scared for all of my friends who relied on the OGL, right? Um there was there was a mix of emotions, but for us personally knowing that we were going to work on that game, it was very exciting. Amazing. And you you just mentioned uh before some inspirations, some some things that you and Matt have a uh, have for like a uh, uh, playing on, on the in, in the on a grid, uh, some inspiration from for E, like mm -hmm. uh, we 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 saw the interview you did in the character 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 sheet uh, channel. Oh yes, and I saw a little a little um, not to for E with the shift mechanic. It, yes, I, I, yes. I played a lot of for E. And I loved it, and this yes. was a, a nice, a nice, uh, <laughs> a nice wink. Uh, so, uh, from that, what would you say are the cultural touchstones of the MC MCDM RPG? What uh, what other RPG, uh, TTRPGs inspired it? Uh, you you mentioned uh, the movies and the relationship you and Matt have with that uh, video games. Uh, we we heard talk. Uh, we heard uh, Matt talk about several times uh, about Marvel Midnight Suns, for example. Yes. So, inspirations <laughs> from everywhere. What what would be the, the main ones? Yeah, so uh, there's definitely... I mean, it's very different from 4th edition, right? There's no role to hit. Um, but there are a lot of similarities, and there's things we've borrowed. Like you said, shifting is part of it, which I really love. Um, you know, the idea of healing surges is, is re- uh capitulated in our game um so 4e is in there there's also a game called shadow of the demon lord uh and now shadow of the weird wizard has come out i love that game by rob schwalb um it, there are ideas from that that we have taken the, there's this idea of boons and banes right in that system um that uh that we've brought in from there i really love that game um we have definitely pulled from video games too so marvel midnight suns uh, is a big one for us because Marvel Midnight Suns, whenever you make an attack, you're dealing damage in that game. And you are also uh, building up 
right? And that's a big thing that we see in a lot of video games. Fighting video games, like Street Fighter and stuff, you might have, like, a limit bar. Um, the Lord of the Rings, uh, like, Shadow of Mordor and Shadow of War games, you have this bar at the top that fills up as you're killing orcs, right? And then you can do ultimate moves with it. Um, we have similar things like that because we wanted to create a game where it wasn't I start out with all of my spells per day or all of my rages or all of my key points and then I winnow it down, right, until I have to rest. We like the idea that, like, you build up to those things so that you could keep adventuring if you wanted to. And it's not like, well, I lost my seventh level spell slot, so why don't we rest now so I can get that back and then I can cast Firestorm again, right? Like that sort of thing we wanted to uh, to avoid. So instead, you're, you're kind of building up to that stuff. Um, so that is uh, Marvel Midnight Suns has like a similar kind of vibe and it's also tactical. It's made by the people who make XCOM. Um, Final Fantasy Tactics is one for me that is a, a touchstone uh, for sure that we, we talk about that a lot. We talk about the Lord of the Rings movies a lot. We also talk about the novels. Matt's like Matt has worked on uh, uh, RPGs for lord of the rings before uh many years ago and he became like a tolkien scholar when he did he had to so we talk about that a lot but the movies right are specifically heroic and cinematic and they're a little more over the top with their action right like legolas surfing on a shield shooting you know that doesn't happen in the book uh but it is fun when you see it right or, or riding up on top of an oliphant to to kill it right that's that kind of thing right those are some of the moments that we want to recreate um so we do reference the movies sometimes uh we do occasionally talk a little bit about like the marvel universe too although we don't want to go too far into super heroic right there's sort of like a, a line there where it can get a little too ridiculous uh and so we're, we're walking that line too like where is the right line and it's funny enough like for me dungeons and dragons honor among thieves the movie that came out this summer right that that is a DD movie that to me feels more like our game than it does like DD. because like for instance the druid doesn't run out of wild shape, right? She can just keep doing it and go from one to the next, that kind of thing. Um, you know, you, you never see somebody talk about like running out of spell slots or, or that sort of thing. And they have those nice high action, they keep pushing themselves moments. Um, so those are the kinds of things that, that we look at. Okay. Um, so going back to something that you just said, uh, just a little bit, um, you work on several different projects, right? Yes. Uh, is, is there something that makes MCDM a different place to work at? And, and this is the second part. Um, you already said that they pay more for, yes. for work. And, and why is this so rare in the industry? You know? Yeah. Both good questions. Um, so one of the things that is great here is the amount that we can pay our freelancers, right? So it's very rewarding for me because now I'm in the position where I'm hiring people who are freelance writers and things like that. And, and just today on Twitter, there's a going around where people are talking about what's the lowest you ever made in TTRPGs? What's the like the your medium, you know, your average and what is your highest? And for a lot of people, the highest is 25 cents a word, which is what we pay, right? And so to see that like, hey, we're at the top of the scale, that's great. But I also think the scale, it would be great if the scale could shift, right? Being 25 cents a word is is good for TTRPGs. For a lot of other writing jobs, it's not. And, and I think you hit the nail on the head, right? It's this industry itself has a hard time paying people well and there's a couple reasons for that one is that it's a very niche industry right it's it's got its challenges um there aren't that many people buying role-playing games uh and there are a lot of people who uh who because of that right like uh, you need to get your friends to play these games with you many of these games you can't play alone right um, and so it becomes hard for people to sell these things because it's like, well, I already have D&D &D or I already have, um, you know, Pathfinder, whatever it may be. I don't want to have to learn a new game. That's that's legitimate, right? Like that. It takes time to learn something. I totally get that. And I don't want to put the money into it. Um, and so what happens is 
that's that's one part of it. The other part of it is I think people's perception of paying for these things is different uh, because they're books, right? So like if you go to a bookstore uh, and you buy a book, an RPG book costs more. But the reason it costs more is because it's a game, right? And so it's more than one author worked on it. It's got more art in it. It was play tested. It was edited by more than one editor, right? It has all of these different facets that go into it, like you would a video game, right? Um, and But people see a book and they think it should cost as much as any other book. And so I think that also prevents people from buying games uh, sometimes. Um, and then because it's small, there's also this distribution problem that we have globally, right? Um, where it's like, I would love for these books to be sold everywhere. I'd love for them to be sold locally. We sell them digitally online, but we only sell them in one language, right? Um, so we, like we don't translate them because we don't have the the uh, facilities to do that properly. We don't have the the time or the budget. Um, and that's that's what a lot of it comes down to is that because these companies aren't making a ton of money, they don't always have a ton of money to spend. Now, I do think there are ways that you can be good to your authors, even if you don't have a lot of money and you want to work with people like profit sharing, right? Saying, hey, we will I can only pay you this much per word. But all, but when we get to the point where we're making more money, right, um, w once once the book is paid for. I'm going to split the profits with you. It's not all going to go to me. We're going to share it, right? Or, hey, you're going to write this for me for this much. But guess what? You get the rights to your work back. And then if you want to publish it on your own, you can, right? Um, so there are different ways that we can help reward writers to make the industry better. We at MCDM, we're lucky, right? We're, we're very lucky. We have a full-time staff, which is almost unheard of. Um, and we we raise a lot of money, which we are then able to put into the product and we're able to pay people a lot of money, which means that we get their like individual attention too. I was uh, uh, arguing with somebody years ago about this where they said, well, I only pay writers five cents a word because I have to fix everything that they do, right? I, it comes to me and it's, and it's rushed and it's bad. And it's, it's like, well, yeah, but if you paid them more, then they wouldn't have to take on a second job to to pay the bills, right? And so that's what we try to do. We try to say, hey, we're, we want to pay you enough that we can be your client and that you will dedicate the amount of time to us that we think is reasonable. Um, you know, and we don't ask people to work uh, like rush jobs usually and that sort of thing. Um, it does occasionally happen. And when it does, we try to pay you more than for that, right? Um, so, uh, but yeah, that's, that's, I think that's one of the things is we're in this mindset of, we have to fix we editors or publishers have to fix everything so we're not going to pay people a lot and then those people are going to rush things because they have to take on three jobs when they should really just take on one right that's the kind of thing we get into i saw the the twitter uh, discourse today about that and, and whenever i saw the 25 cents i, I said that's the same number that they always mention for mcdm <laughs> so i I had that in mind when, when you were answering the question. Uh, we ask some of, now uh, we will get a, a little more into the system uh, for people watching at home that this yes. is where the, the fun part begins. Um, we, asked, uh, we asked some of our closest friends. We asked, for example, one of the players in uh, one of the TTRPG clubs that we participate in. And uh, after seeing the, the combat scenario that you play tested with uh, Chris Hofer in the character sheet, uh, he and I, that uh, I, I also have experience with 4 edition D&D, for example, that, which has some similarities, uh, of course. Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, definitely. Uh, one of the questions he had, and this is a really interesting question to, to ask, is does the MCDM RPG, uh, the holding place title, of course, uh, work well at higher levels? Because when we played 4 edition D&D, uh, at lower levels, it worked perfectly. Uh, I mean, anyone that has tried uh, remembers that. But whenever we got to the higher levels, uh, enemies and PCs were big sponges of uh, hit points and the combats were really long. Uh, how, how did you handle? I assume that you, of course, 
handle this problem now. But how how does the MCDM RPG tackle this this issue that again with a similar ambition had in the past? Yeah, that I mean, what how right you are about fourth edition is I incredible. I remember I so I've played two level one to thirty campaigns. I ran two to and it would be like at, by twentieth level if somebody was spending an action point, you're like, oh, don't spend it because it now it triggers this and then but also the rogue gets to do this over here and once per day when you die, this is going to happen, right? And my daily power, it was just. Uh, it, it was, and it, it, combat would take like an hour per t per round, right? Was was very uh, a big grind, and so that's something we're very aware of. We have not designed the highest level of this game yet, right? So everything I'm about to say, take with a grain of salt. Um, but I will say one thing that we're doing is that this game only goes to tenth level. Right. When you're at 10th level, you will be big and powerful. You'll be like Hercules. Right. It's not going to be like we we just shrunk everything down. Right. So so when you go from one to two, you get lots more powerful in our game than you would in fourth edition D and D. Right. But what that means is you your powers and the things that you can do become more impactful, but we're not necessarily going to make it more complicated, right? So you might deal more damage, right? And you might deal uh, uh, like uh, your your resistance to things might be hardier, your, your hit points might get higher, right? But what you're not gonna see is like, by the time you're 10th level, now I have 30 options to choose from. And on, on my turn, I have to figure out which one. And I have to figure out how it interacts with your 30 options, right? It'll be like, no, you have maybe five really cool things in combat that you can do. We'll, we'll try to keep it to that, right? Because it's like, do you need more than that? Probably not. Um, and five cool things you could do out of combat to influence role-playing scenes and investigation and stuff like that. Um, so that's the plan, right? Is that by only going to 10th level... People won't feel the need to, like, when you go to 20th or 30th level, people want to get something every time they level up, right? Um, but if we keep it at, like, hey, you'll get something, and you'll get more powerful, but we're not going to make it that you go all the way up to here. Because the, the truth is, right, most people uh, don't play don't play even 10 levels of D&D &D when they sit down to play D&D, &D, right? They play one uh and the game falls apart after six sessions or whatever so our plan is to give you something that you can see and achieve the end of and that's uh that's a big part of that good really good question so i i have a follow-up question to to that um other, other games like shadow of the demon lord which I, I heard you in in an interview talk about uh, as an inspiration too uh, also have this uh, 10 level um, uh, leveling system. Uh, uh, are MCDM RPG campaigns intended to be shorter, equal uh, than uh, campaigns of 5e, for example, which is the, the unavoidable comparison that everyone will make, right? Of course, uh, of course. How, how do you imagine when you design this game the, the length of, of campaigns in this system? Yeah, that is a. Uh, I, so I think they will be a little bit shorter than a D and D campaign. Um, I would say if we were to take it all and like put uh, uh, put a level one to ten campaign in a book, right? It would probably be between three and five hundred pages. So let's say four hundred pages, right, of, of content. And I think that would be really good, right? Um, and you would be able then to do that. We imagine, let's say you played once a week, occasionally skipping because somebody gets sick or goes on vacation or has to work, right? We would imagine that maybe you could get it done in like 30 to 40 sessions. Um, it, and those are all arbitrary numbers I'm kind of pulling out of my uh, butt right now. Uh, but, uh, but you know, that's, that's sort of the goal is that we want it to be a thing that is achievable for people and honestly getting getting somebody together for 30 sessions a year sometimes it's easy right like i i do this for a living i play all the time 
I go to conventions. I don't have kids. Uh, so it means that I have the freedom to do it. But there, a lot of times people have kids. They have hard jobs. They have, uh, you know, they have to travel. They have family who needs them, whatever it is. Um, and so we want to make it a thing that, like, you can sit down and play a campaign of this game and uh, and see the end in sight, right, when you do it. Amazing. So we we it's amazing talking with you. Uh, oh, good. So we 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 talk a lot about combat, but you often point out that one of the main pillars of play uh, of the MCDM RPG is negotiation. Yes. Why yes. why is this so important in a <laughs> heroic, tactical, cinematic, fantasy, cool game? Yes, great. Really, uh, I I'm loving these questions. You all did your research. This is great. Um, the uh, the so for us, negotiation is key because I think there's a lot of things. There's a lot of interactions we have in uh, a fantasy game, right? Where it's like, oh, okay, roll to intimidate. You do it. You get past the guard, right? Or that goblin is going to give you the information, and it's just one check and a little bit of role play, but. I do think we sometimes get into these scenes where it's like, I want something from you. Uh -huh. And I, and you want to give it to me, sort of, but you're reluctant for some reason, and I need to convince you. And the game master has to decide, it, feel, it should be more than one check, right? Like, that's what we know. It should be more than one check. But we don't know. It's sort of, the, the way I've seen that played is that, like, People keep playing until the game master is tired of it and it's like, okay, you can do this. Here you go. You, you get this because I want to move on to the next thing now. Or, no, you can't have it because you rolled too many ones and go, go find something else to do, right? Uh, so we wanted to put rules on that, especially because we do see that as a big part of a heroic fantasy story, right? There's always the Aragorn goes to Rohan and tries to convince Theoden to help the people of Gondor, right? Um, there is, uh, hey, I'm going to come to uh, try to convince you that you need, like, the Council of Elrond, that we need to do something with this ring and what I think is the most important, right? So to draw on that Lord of the Rings sort of analogy uh, again. But you also see that in, in other stories, right? The people in the Expanse are heroes, I would say, right? And they're constantly going around to Mars or to the belt and they're saying like, hey, help us out. We, we need this help. Can you do this for us? We're trying to, we need your help with the Rossi so that we can go save the world, right? Um, and so those are the kinds of things that we know heroes do. And we know in games that it helps if there's a little bit more support for that. And we're, you know, I think right now we're trying to figure out like, how do we make this work? How do we make it so that you still have all the fun of role playing that scene? But there's enough structure to it that the person running the game can say, okay, I know how this ends and I know what the outcome should be, right? Um, and certainly we've seen a couple of different iterations we've shown to people. The very first one, people were like, this is way too uh, rigid, right? It was way too strict in how it went back and forth. And it was like, oh, okay, let's loosen it up. And now we're playing it now. And a lot of people like it, but I think we could get more on there. So Matt and I had a big meeting about how do we loosen it up some more, right? So we're, we're in a good place right now where we're figuring out how do we keep the structure, but also make it fun for everybody who's playing, right? And, and I think some of the best rules are like, they get out of the way, but they're still there supporting you. And so we're figuring it, all that out. So, so following that, uh, you you also mentioned a, a different set of pillars in, in this in this heroic, yeah. tactical, cinematic fantasy game, like research or craft. Yes, <laughs> yes, the uh, most exciting thing you can do: <laughs> research. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> can you tell us uh, anything about what can we expect from the MCDM RPG in that area? Yeah, so part of, I, I think one of the things we talked about was like, we like when people can think tactically outside of the battle map too, right? So uh, if you've ever played a game where you have a heist and you're like, oh, we need to break into here, right? Um, or, hey, before our negotiation, it would be great if we knew more about this queen that we're going to talk to, right? Um, 
you so research becomes part of planning your adventure right in that you can get information on people so or on a place that you're going or that kind of thing but you can also do research to aid you in crafting and crafting is part of prep too right so saying okay we need to get to the top level of the lich's lair so we can steal the book of the dead right um we could fight our way through 20 levels of people and then get all the way to the top of this tower or what if we found a way to teleport to the top and then we had a bunch of vials of acid and we burned through the roof and came right like those are the kinds of things that we imagine you'll be able to do with the research and crafting system is you'll say like i really wish we had this you know there's there's a lot of times where someone will say like if i just had a magic sword right i would be able to fight this enemy better but it's the the gm hasn't noticed that i want a magic sword yet and, and hasn't given it to me well what if you could go make it yourself right and you you know that would take time and resources it wouldn't be a thing you could just do right away but you could start planning towards it um and so those are the kinds of things that we see people being able to do uh while they're resting or in between adventures and things like that So let's jump a little bit into the future. Once the uh, MCDM, between parentheses, <laughs> we don't know the name yet, a uh, core book is published. What uh, other books can we expect for the system? I mean, what, what would you like to, to develop, uh, uh, to expand, to add on to the MCDM RPG? What can we expect from from? Uh, you as designers to add to this game in a second or, or third uh, instance of development. Yeah, so the first two books that are coming are the ones that are promised in the backer kit, right? So the core rules and a book of monsters, because this is a game about fighting monsters, so we want to give you a lot of them. Uh, we've also talked about in that backer kit campaign uh, doing a campaign setting box set for Vasloria, which is our version of like medieval fantasy Europe. Um, and uh, and so that is something that we also want to create and make. And it would be a box that comes with maps and an adventure and all this other stuff um, to help you play your game in this world. Um, now, if we make more than that, it's because people liked all of those things and want more, right? And that's the hope is that people do want those things and want more. So the plan is from there, uh, you know, it would be great. We have other campaign settings in mind that we might make. If you watched the chain of Acheron, Matt has this game that he did a, a live play of um, where uh, it took place in Capital, which is this big city, uh, fantasy city uh, where stuff happened. So it could be a Capital thing. Uh, our Vasloria and Capital are on a planet called Orden, which is in this vast universe called the Timescape, right? And there are all these other planets. We might do something with that. Uh, we'd like to do uh, books that you, if you're familiar with like Kingdoms of Warfare and Strongholds and Followers, we'd like to take those rules and adapt them for our game right um and so we'd like to to do stuff like that we have ideas for maybe doing more monster books uh and i already can tell you that we're not going to get every player option in the book because we just have so many we want to make right so we'll probably put out some classes and things like that I, I don't know which classes are going into the book yet so i don't know which ones we'll make later um but i the plan is to continue to support this and we may even bring back something like arcadia i don't know if it would be in the same form but something like that to help support the game month to month and give people more content would be really wonderful for us so those are all things that we've kicked around and, and ideas that we have so i i have a follow-up question to this mm -hmm. one of the um, uh, goals that you had in the in the backer kit campaign which you achieved and you are will try to do you were very clear that you will try to do this uh, yes yes is the, the ptt the, the virtual tabletop and uh, why why is it important for you to have your own btt for this game because this is something that uh, we are just starting to see in the industry i mean dnd is going to have their own 
uh, their own BTT probably this year or the following year with all the it's, uh, the bells and whistles uh, and the Unreal Engine, you are going to have cross fingers, your own BTT. Why is it important for a game to have its own BTT? Yeah, so I want to, one thing that I want to say is that having our own VTT does not mean that we will be closed off from being on other VTTs, right? That you might be able to use our stuff on Roll20 or Foundry or Fantasy Grounds or uh, uh, Albert Rodeo, whatever your VTT of choice is. Um, you know, uh, I, will it be there? I don't know, but we have not closed ourselves off from that. But the reason we want to create our own is I feel like, and I know Matt does and the, the rest of the team does too, if we have our own VTT, then we can better serve our customers, right? And because if it's in-house, at first it means that it is made for our game, right? So when you sit down to play it, you don't have to tell it, this is what I want to do. And I kind of have to work around the fact that this table isn't going to do what I want for the game that I want to play, or I need to program these things into it, or I need to customize like, nope, it's going to be there. It's going to be ready. It also means that we can supply it with our content right away in a way that like we could get in there and change rules, right? If it's like, hey, this rule, we're, we're going to play test things in the table. We're going to let everybody who's playing in the table play test stuff. And we're going to change and update the rules as we go so that you have, and we'll let you know, right? Like we won't necessarily sneak it in, in there, but that would be a, a vast boon to us to be able to serve our customers at sort of lightning speed like that and say, okay, here you go. Um, and I think the other thing is that we're exploring right now, how, how would it work that if you buy one of our products, you can also get it then on the VTT at the same time? right um those and, and you can only do that right now if you own the vtt platform that you're putting your stuff on right um so and there's a lot of uh, uh the main reason though for us is that we think the cool the virtual tools will be more powerful if they are made specifically for our game rather than someone taking our game and trying to put it on their tool if that makes sense Excellent. So, going uh, a little back to to Arcadia, you just mentioned that. Will you keep publishing 5e compatible content? I so I think we are done at least for now. Right, the the future okay. is uncertain. Who knows? Um, but right now, the plan is to be done with 5e uh, indefinitely. Um, and so we put out, the last thing we put out was actually the week we launched the backer kit, uh, the revision of the ill rigger, um, which is a class we put out back at the beginning of 2021. Um, and we, uh, we did a big revision of that. So that is now available and out there in the world. Sadie Lowry was the lead designer. She came to us uh, first by working on Arcadia and has worked on Flea Mortals and Where Evil Lives and all this other great stuff for us. She's awesome. Um, and uh, and so that is now uh, out there in the world uh, and people can, uh, can play it, but I think that is the last 5e thing for us. So, so, so I have to, to follow that question. How, how that feels? <laughs> uh, <laughs> For me, personally, it feels pretty good. Um, so I, especially now, right? Like standing here on the other side of the backer kit campaign, we know now that people did want the game. That was a huge relief because we were worried, right? Uh, we were worried that maybe nobody would want this, right? And the numbers, right? Yes, 4.6 million is huge and it's going to change the way that we're able to operate in a big way. But the even more important number for us is over 30,000 people, right? That's the most people that have ever backed an MCDM crowdfunding campaign. Um, and it means that there are at least 30,000 people interested in playing this game, right? And, and so that is the big thing that we have clocked and we're excited about. But it was scary when we, before that, because... I, I've been working on 5e. Uh, I, I started blogging about 
5e during the D&D next playtest, right? Um, in 2013. And so for 10 years, right, I was talking about this game and I was making stuff for it and I was ready to move on and immerse myself in other stuff. And I have been very lucky to work on other games and I'm always excited when I am. Um, and there's a lot to love about 5th edition d and I've played a ton of games of it. I love my memories with it and I'll probably continue to occasionally play games of D&D, right? Um, but in terms of working on it and making stuff for it, I'm glad to be done because I feel like I've made a lot of the things that I've wanted to make for it. And I feel like it's time for me personally to to move on. So I, it feels good to uh, to leave it behind. I bet. <laughs> so um, this is for the for the future. Uh, if you have any advice to people that are just starting our TTRPG designer uh, career, uh, that, that maybe have the dream to work uh, in companies such as MCDM or any other company out there, what would you tell them? Uh, what would be a good career path for them? Yeah, so there's, there's no wrong... <laughs> well, there's many wrong ways, but there's no one right way either, right? Um, and I think the biggest things are in today's world, right? It used to be that you could like submit to Dungeon and Dragon magazine or uh, find a find a publisher and pitch them. That doesn't really happen these days. So you need to create on your own first. Uh, you need to put your stuff out there on a blog or on Drive Through RPG or Itch or on your own website. Uh, and those are that's like one of the best ways to start. And then. You need to get that stuff out there, right? You need to promote that stuff. And and it's hard. Not everybody likes promoting themselves. I don't love it. Um, and But what you the best way to do that, that I know how, is to get involved in the community, right? To uh, go talk to other people. There are going to be people who are looking for collaborators on projects in Facebook groups, on Twitter, on social media, at your local game store, um, uh, at conventions, right? Uh, it's a great play to, uh, to go and meet people. Um, and you, like, give to the community better than you expect to get back right become part of that community same way you all are right now right you're doing a a, a show here uh for your community right like giving to your community is so huge and do it because you care about it um so th that's the big thing is like you want to make things give yourself a schedule know that you, it's going to be hard at first and so give yourself plenty of time on your first couple of projects to really figure it out forgive yourself if you make mistakes um but you definitely want to be involved in the community be a good community member you know help out when when people are asking for help offer it uh and then when you need help they will offer it to you too uh the other thing is work on the thing that you want to work on that's really huge right it's like if you have a great idea for something but instead you go work on something else because you think that's where the the trend is, right? Um, like, hey, I want to make this uh, uh, these cool squid monsters, but right now donkeys are really in, so I'm going to go work on donkeys instead, even though I don't like donkeys. Don't do that. Don't do that. Go work on squid monsters, right? Because your enthusiasm for the project is going to be what carries you through to the next stage of it it's going to be the thing that makes you give it that extra proofread it's going to be the thing that allows you to get out there and promote it right because you're excited about it and that excitement and your love for it is genuine and that's the whole reason we do this if you want to go make money you know go be a banker uh or or uh something else right um but if you're doing this because you love this hobby make the things that you love those are more likely to be successful financially and they'll definitely be more creatively fulfilling for you I have a, one last question pertaining to that. Uh, what is your dream product? I mean, huh. uh, what would uh, James Intracaso, right now, the James Intracaso of January 2024, if he has the money, the time uh, to work on it, what would you, your dream 
uh, game or or book be right now? Yes. Yeah, well, aside, uh, what I am working on right now, and this is genuine, right, is is a dream come true. And so I'm very happy right now, and I feel uh, like a lucky, lucky person um, to be able to do that. But that's not a fun answer to your question. So uh, I would really like to work on a supers RPG. I have uh, ideas for I'd like to create like a, I, I think it's hard to find a supers RPG that isn't either overly simple or overly complicated. And I would like to work on something that I think is fun. You can sit down, you can create the character you want and everybody has a, a, a good time and it feels distinct and unique in the rules. Um, so that's a, a big dream project for me. Uh, another dream project that I would really like to work on is I would like to create uh, a retirement home for gamers. Uh, so, you know, I listen, we're all going to be old someday, right? Uh, and like w people are now in the generation where it's like, hey, when I'm old, I want to I want to sit around with friends and play games. And all my friends who have kids and can't play right now, right? They're finally going to have the time when they're old uh, to, to play games. And so uh, so one of my dream projects uh, outside of, of creating games, right, is to create a retirement home where like gamers can get together, right? And like there's like, you know, there's rooms where there's role playing games happening. There's board games. There's like a big uh, video game room, right? And that kind of thing. So. Uh, that is that's the that's one of my dreams too. <laughs> it's it's like uh, the I, opposite is not the word, but uh, the the other the other end of the RPG club in high school. Like, yes, exactly. Ex yeah, it's so yeah, it's where you go, right? Your RPG club gets together like 60 <laughs> years later in the uh, in the retirement home. That's the idea. Yeah, exactly. So looking for investors right now, if anybody's interested, we can. <laughs> so it, it's really good to have games that have uh, campaigns that can be finished in a couple of years. You, you never know what might happen there. So uh, a little bit of that humor there. But exactly. Uh, James, <laughs> thank you so much for this interview. Uh, it is, uh, I'm going to steal beyond uh, words. The, these are not mine, but it is such a treat to have designers such as yourself here. Um, I learned a lot about uh, about the MCDM RPG and the philosophy and design process behind it. Uh, so so really, really thanks for that. I don't know, Leon, Paul, if you want to say anything. Go for it. Yes, 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 of course. This was amazing, and and thank you for for your openness. <laughs> your <laughs> your sharing skills are beautiful to 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 be chatting with you. It, it's amazing. Like uh, we 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 expect uh, to see what what the name is of this RPG and what the content uh, ends up being. This uh, this is amazing and promising, and we we are all. Uh, hoping the best for you and for the TTRPG community that, that will grow with this. It, this is an amazing project and, well, hope you the best. Um, for me, thank you for being here. It, it's really nice having the opportunity to talk to you. And, and I have to say for the record, I like the name MCDM Ampreshi. It's like bold. Nice. Uh, <laughs> I, I, it's like, we are here, we are doing this, this is where we are. Uh, and I just like it. Uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's a, a nice choice, but I understand. <laughs> I also understand <laughs> that you might need some some other thing. And and as the as the, as the team said, uh, this is such a treat. Uh, I really enjoy talk to you, and I really hope to to play your games. Thank you. Well. Thank you all for having me uh, on your show. This was amazing, and you all have done your research. This is one of the best interviews I've ever had. So thank you okay. so, so much for uh, for inviting me on. Your community is incredibly lucky to have you, uh, and I can't wait for more people to discover you. This is awesome. <laughs>